delighted to be here, and I thank the organizers for including me with uh, such a distinguished group of colleagues. Um, I'm Philip Seed from the University of Southern California, and I'm going to talk today about public diplomacy. Uh, and my, my talk is going to be somewhat prescriptive. I've spent much of the past month uh, publicly telling people at the State Department what they ought to be doing, which for some reason they have not seemed to appreciate. Uh, but uh, I want to talk a little bit about the, the framework in which public diplomacy, not just U.S. public diplomacy, but pretty much uh, pr primarily uh, American diplomacy, is being developed today. Uh, the media ecology has changed, and the, there is a new landscape in which public diplomacy must be conducted. Uh, there is certainly a decline, if not a total demise, of Western hegemony in the media field. And this is clearly not understood by those in the U.S. government who have been planning public diplomacy. There is now something that, that I call in lectures and in a book I did a couple of years ago, the Al Jazeera effect. And it doesn't pertain just to Al Jazeera per se, just as the CNN effect doesn't really pertain to exclusively to CNN. But what the Al Jazeera effect is, and we saw some of this demonstrated in the talk this morning that showed all the, the increase in internet penetration and the rise of satellite television, is the changing nature of discourse brought about by the increased both interactive and more traditional communication that is available in the, in the Middle East and, and elsewhere. Uh, the Al Jazeera effect also speaks toward the, the political repercussions of having these, these new media available. And my theory is that they exercise a subtle and sometimes very incremental democratizing influence, and that needs to be kept in mind by those who work in the field of public diplomacy. Going beyond satellite television, there are now indigenous internet communities, which aren't fully understood. I mean, we, we can get into the theory of networks as advanced by Manuel Castells and others, um, and talk about network structure and their connectivity and things like that. But the fact is, this media ecology today, which in the Middle East and much of the rest of the world was, was quite barren just uh, 15, 20 years ago, it is now like a garden in which many seeds are beginning to, beginning to sprout. Now, to speak specifically about U.S. public diplomacy through broadcasting, the United States is, is clearly wedded still to a Cold War model, and that is, uh, that is best exemplified, I think, by Al Hura of the Arabic language news channel. When I, when I go to the Middle East, I don't even ask people if they watch it. I ask if they know anyone who watches it. And uh, I haven't been able to find, uh, the only place I can find audiences in the surveys that Al Hura itself releases in that. Uh, so I, I don't take that too seriously. But the, 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 you can understand what the model is if you look back to the 1950s, which says something in itself about US foreign policy. But during the 50s and the, and the 60s, particularly and into the 70s, uh, the United States had considerable success, particularly in Eastern Europe, with things such as Voice of America and Radio Free Europe, because there was an audience there that had no indigenous news sources, or very few indigenous news sources that they trusted. The competition for VOA and RFE was Radio Moscow, Radio Bucharest, and their brethren. People in the region in Eastern Europe at that time were hungry for other voices, for a voice they could trust more than what they were getting from, from Moscow and, and Moscow's satellites. That is the philosophy behind Al Hura, but it, it takes no recognition of the fact that in the Middle East today, there are sources that people trust. Uh, and there are plenty of them, whether it's Al Jazeera, Al Arabiya, or, or any of the many more sources of information, both broadcast, print, online, wherever. It is a very journalistically rich environment, an unprecedentedly journalistically rich environment. And so there's no need for Al Hura. 
The hunger that was there in the 1950s during the Cold War doesn't exist today. And it's interesting, if you, if you were to attend the Don Rumsfeld School of Journalism, you would hear that, uh, that Al Jazeera is a failure because it does not subscribe to the norms of, of Western journalistic objectivity. But that misses the whole point. The point is credibility. Uh, objectivity is a, is a relative thing, and I can give you plenty of examples of Western news organizations in which objectivity is certainly a myth. Um, but it's the credibility that, it, that is so important. There's a new audience out there. And just as, as CNN uh, really earned its spurs in 1991 with its coverage of the Gulf War, I think uh, Al Jazeera really established itself in 2000 uh, with its coverage of the Intifada. And what you hear related to that particular episode and more generally, and you hear this not just from, pe from people involved with Al Jazeera, but also with other channels such as Telesur and, uh, coming out of Venezuela, is we want to see our world through our eyes. Uh, we want to see Arab events told, told to Arabs by Arab reporters. And therefore, Al Hura, or to a certain extent, CNN, BBC, and others, really aren't as necessary anymore. And until the Western governments recognize that this new media ecology exists, their public diplomacy efforts are going to be stymied. Now, there have been efforts to, uh, to try to base public diplomacy, U.S. public diplomacy, more on the Internet. Uh, for example, when Barack Obama gave his speeches in Accra and Cairo, uh, there was an effort to disseminate those speeches uh, through email, blogs, to, to reach as many people as possible uh, through the internet. And the speeches were great. Uh, the Cairo speech was, was, was beautiful rhetoric. Uh, but again, one of the failures of public diplomacy, U.S. public diplomacy, is its detachment from policy. Um, after the beautiful words, what was left? Um, if, for example, in that speech or shortly thereafter, President Obama had, had declared that there would be a joint U.S.-Arab states Marshall Plan for Palestine, uh, that would have had some traction. That would, have, that would have won some support for the United States. But just beautiful words were thin. So that's another lesson for U.S. public diplomats is that the message must be accompanied by policy. Uh, there's a need for strategy. There's a need to, to, to bring people in the communities that you're trying to reach into the conversation. Yet another problem of U.S. public diplomacy is too much time is spent selling America, selling the U.S. brand, saying how great America is, without really being concerned about the, the needs and the wants of the people that you're reaching. Now, in, in terms of, of Arab states' public diplomacy, um, the current status, I think, is the way you could appraise uh, Arab states' public diplomacy is it's, it's not particularly notable and not particularly successful. Uh, Qatar, of course, is, a, is an, an exception because the whole creation of Al Jazeera was in part a public diplomacy exercise to, to extend the Qatar identity, also to annoy the Saudis, but also to... But, but to uh, but to, to put Qatar on the map, and, and it's been very successful in that. But there, there is a need now on the part of Arab states uh, to define goals and create mechanisms. Um, one of the most popular internet sites, I think, in terms of reaching the rest of the world is Queen Rania's uh, online presence. And that's very sophisticated, very well done, has a considerable following. Uh, but, but that's not enough. I mean, that is not part of, of a, even a national strategy, much less a strategy uh, that you see emanating from the region. So what, what comes next? Well, one thing I think is a recognition that there is, there now public diplomacy must deal with, with virtual states. Um, there is a virtual Arab community and an even larger virtual, virtual Muslim community that is connected not just by shared interest, but by, by the interactive media that so many people work with. Um, the people who were previously isolated now share common satellite channels. 
They talk to each other on cell phones, they read the same blogs, they look at the same websites, they Twitter to one another. Uh, there is a kind of conversation out there that is more intense and more widespread and more fully ignorant of the boundaries of, of old time borders uh, that, than ever before. So public diplomacy, I guess one quick example would be, if you're doing public diplomacy toward Pakistan, what is Pakistan? Is it the landmass northwest of India, or is it the global Pakistani community, a million in the UK, a million in Saudi Arabia and elsewhere? Well, the same thing applies to, to much of the Arab world and, and to other communities around the world, that there are these virtual states. Um, so therefore, what is the challenge for public diplomacy on the part of the United States, on the part of Arab states and others. It is to recognize, I think in part, that the new technologies, beginning with satellite, te satellite television and moving all the way through the internet-based technologies, is not just technology in itself, is not just a tool, is not just a gimmick, but rather the messages must be shaped to reach the audiences that these new media uh, allow to be reached. And until the United States, and for that matter, the Arab states learn to do that, public diplomacy is going to be something nice, but not something substantive. And that's the change, the challenge that now faces public diplomats in America, in the Middle East, and elsewhere. Thank you.